Hello, you found us again. Here we are. Um, now, unusually, we're going to go to Roz now, and she's going to make a little announcement. You might have heard it before, but it's a gentle reminder. Thanks, Roz. Sir. Thanks, Alan. Just to remind you listeners that if you do have any problems with the new upcoming digital age that we're just about to reach here on the Enfield Talking newspaper, please feel free to contact Diane de Jersey, who I'm sure will be very happy to help you. And back to Alan. Thank you very much, Roz. You did that so well. You can do it again at the end of the show. Over to you, Sonia. When Paris came under attack... This year's Mercury Prize winner, Benjamin Clementine, realised just how close the city was to his heart. Raised in Edmonton, he spent six years begging and busking on the French streets before being discovered. So when he took to the stage to accept his award for debut album, at least for now, he brought the audience to a hushed silence by dedicating it to the French capital and all those affected by the terror attacks. I realised how much Paris meant to me a few days ago, says Benjamin, who lived near the site of the attacks and travelled back there just hours after they happened. I have walked those streets, begged on those streets. I was really shocked and deeply hurt when I heard the news so I had to go back to give my respect. It is my second home. I have learned so much from Paris about fighting for tomorrow and not giving up. In England, we are more gentle about it, but in France, they are more passionate about putting your faith in things. Benjamin certainly put his faith in the city when he moved there, aged 19, with hardly a penny to his name. He has previously admitted he went there to escape his family. And when we chat, says, I had a very religious family, I must admit. We went to church almost every day. It was literally 30 seconds from our house and the priest was our neighbour. Benjamin attended Bishop Stopford School in Enfield. It's a Christian school and so we had communion every morning, he recalls. I remember one time the piano player wasn't in, so I sat down and had to play It Was Abide With Me, I think. I played it by ear because I can't read music. I can't remember anything else from school. I didn't like spending time there. When his parents divorced, Benjamin moved to Camden for a short while and then to Paris, unwittingly setting himself on the path to fame as he was forced to sing publicly for the first time. I was always singing at home and humming, but I didn't sing out in church or anything. But when I went to Paris, I had no choice. I sounded terrible, and I still do, but at least now I have something to say. And it was in France that he first realised music was what he wanted to do. One time I was playing in a hotel in Cannes, and in the middle of a gig, people were talking. So I left the hotel, went to a nearby bar, and there was a piano. I started playing it. Everyone started coming from the bar and stood right next to me and listened. I've not stopped since. Before then, I just liked music and just played it for passion, but didn't think it would be a career. My parents certainly never showed me it could be, And they were right in some ways because it is very hard to make a career as an artist. Benjamin spent time sleeping on the streets and begging and says Paris brought him down to the ground floor and taught him to value life and respect everyone as equals. In fact, he didn't speak to anyone for his first three years there, only singing in bars and then going home to sleep and eat. Eventually, when I recorded my EP is when I started opening up to people. My music pretty much saved me, explains the 26-year-old. His music started getting airtime on the radio and a performance on 
later with Jules Holland, quickly followed. A year later he was signed, and another year after that began making his debut album, At Least For Now, which includes the tracks London, St Clementine on Tea and Croissants, and Winston Churchill's Boy, although a song entitled Edmonton didn't make the cut. But his hometown will always hold a special place in his heart, and he would like to spend his prize money on pianos for the area. I'm glad to be a British artist, and the Mercury made me realise that. He isn't in touch with his family, who still live in the area, except his elder brother, but says he thinks they are proud of him. My passion has always been to sing for myself and for the people. I'm not going to change my mind about that. I'm still doing the same thing as I was on the streets and in the bars, singing in front of somebody, singing to somebody, and giving something to somebody. In terms of attention and professionalism, of course it has changed drastically. But in terms of the reason why I'm doing this, no, it hasn't changed. Benjamin will play a sold-out gig at St John at Hackney Church on December the 7th. Details, benjaminclementine.com An unarmed police officer who climbed onto a roof to beckon two young children playing in a garden to safety as a man with a machete rampaged through their street has been given a special commendation by a High Court judge. Constable Stephen Robertson was one of the officers called to the scene in Nightingale Road, Edmonton, when paranoid schizophrenic Nicholas Salvador killed 82-year-old Palmyra Silva in the garden of her home in September 2014. At Salvador's trial at the Old Bailey in June, Judge Nicholas Hilliard particularly commended 32-year-old P.C. Robertson for his actions. Salvador was tracked by a police helicopter and as officers scrambled to evacuate nearby homes, unarmed officers were ordered to withdraw. Despite hearing the order, P.C. Robertson realised there were people in their gardens, oblivious to the potential danger, and he climbed onto a garage roof to gesture to a family to flee. Chief Inspector Sharon Harding said it was a tragic day and officers' heroic actions undoubtedly prevent further loss of lives. Situations like this call for teamwork of the highest, which was without doubt exhibited by all, he said. Sometimes people stand out and deserve some kind of recognition. She described how P.C. Robertson realised how serious the situation was and climbed onto the roof, despite the order for unarmed officers to leave the area. She said he immediately saw two young children playing in the garden. They didn't hear him, but eventually he attracted their attention by waving his warrant card and he directed them into the house. The children and their parents were taken to safety by the police, fleeing from their house through a window. P.C. Robertson, a former lifeguard, joined the police nine years ago. The Edmonton-based officer said he heard on the police radio that there were people in the garden and he acted on instinct to get them to safety. He said it was one of those split-second decisions that you make. He spotted the children's father sitting in a covered area and gestured with his police baton and warrant card for the family to go indoors. Salvador was found not guilty of Mrs Silver's murder by reason of insanity and was ordered to be detained indefinitely at Broadmoor Psychiatric Hospital. At Friday's Borough Commander's Commendation Ceremony, 14 officers received recognition for teamwork and dedication to duty while safeguarding the public and securing and preserving evidence. They were Air Observers Captain Lee Toos and PCs Andrew Cronkshaw and Rick Tatalia, Detective Sergeant Alan Dawson, P.C. Gareth Bowen, Sergeant Jamie Mogridge, Detective Sergeant Alan Dawson, P.C.'s Amy Carter, 
Jackie Alexander and Adam Tradia, Detective Constable Jennifer Melling and PCs Jamie Edgus, Ian McPherson and Stacey Gilbert. PC Bowen had been finishing his shift when he was called to the scene. He recalled, Our group of officers were there first and we were getting people out of the houses. He said police were going up and down the road to lead people to safety. A leading councillor has insisted that donations to food banks do not absolve government bodies from their responsibilities towards children and families who are struggling to make ends meet. Yasmin Brett, the cabinet member for Community Organisations and Culture, led Enfield Council's Mitzvah Day, Good Deeds, by helping organise a donation of non-perishable food to the food bank in Lincoln Road, Ponders End. However, the new data from Trussell Trust showing that all of London boroughs were figures were available, Enfield provided the fifth highest amount of three-day emergency food supplies between April and September. Joan Ryan, the Labour MP for Enfield North, said, It is outrageous that so many families with children are having to rely on food banks to put food on the table. She added that by accepting food banks as the norm, there was a danger of depending on them rather than challenging the circumstances that led to families relying on them in the very first place. Mrs Brett said that rather than endorsing food banks as a solution to low pay, tax credit changes and rising bills, the council's donation to them was just one element of the local authorities' attempts to help residents cope in the face of government cuts. She told the advertiser, Our research with Oxfam, the Church of England and the Trussell Trust found that problems with benefits are the biggest trigger of food bank use. So while food donations are sadly necessary for many families, the long-term solutions lie with the DWP. Between a quarter and a third of food bank users in our study were waiting for a benefit claim, which had not been decided, and between 19 and 28% had household benefits stopped or reduced because of a sanction. Yet when they challenged around half of sanctions are overturned. No parent wants to rely on charity to feed their family, but benefit delays can mean there's no other option. Eat from the food bank or don't eat at all. No parent should have to make that decision in the UK today. Addressing the drill drivers of UK food poverty must become a national priority. That means fixing benefits administration, protecting the value of family benefits, including tax credits, and tackling low pay and rising housing costs. Until that happens, hard-up families will continue to be exposed to hunger. Mm. A leading light in the battle to raise awareness of and fund research into motor neurone disease has died at the age of 49. Eric Rivers of Gordon Road, Enfield, became a familiar face in the borough after he featured on BBC television programme DIY SOS four years ago. The episode detailed the modifications of Eric and his wife Davina's home that, need, that were needed in the wake of his MND diagnosis in 2010. The couple's defiance in the face of the disease that gradually attacks the body's neurological processes inspired residents across the borough, and Eric and Davina both featured in public campaigns to raise events to raise money for more research into finding a cure. After five years living with the disease, Eric died at home on November the 7th, with Davina and his three daughters, Summer, aged 17, Jody, aged 15, and Layla, aged 9, at his side. I think he was just incredible, Davina said of her husband. I think he was a natural teacher. He taught me what unconditional love meant. He taught me what it was like to be loved without judgment and without criticism. He was so inspirational. She told the advertiser that the words she tells people to remember her husband by is his mantra of don't sleepwalk your way through life. Take the time to enjoy the privilege of getting old. 
Before his diagnosis, Eric was a project manager for Virgin Media and was passionate about cricket playing at Hornsey CC. Cricket was his passion, Davina said. His teammates loved him and they have all expressed the loss they feel. Many successful officers owe a debt of thanks to Inspector Jim Clune. He has been involved in mentoring police in Enfield and at least eight officers who achieved promotion have benefited from his guidance as they put in their applications. He has been involved in arranging mock interview boards and ensured that his colleagues got all important feedback as they prepared for the real thing. According to his citation for professionalism and leadership through mentoring and developing officers, Inspector Clune gave up many hours of his own time while on and off duty to give advice. Special Constable Tommy Kiriaku has excelled in his duties and is starting work as a full-time officer. He will be at Hendon Training College in the new year before starting on the beat in Haringey. He was already working as a detention officer at Edmonton Police Station in Fore Street and decided to become a special to find out what the job entails. He was praised for his contribution, including the sensitive way he dealt with the victim of a serious sexual assault and his professionalism. He was named the Special Constable of the Year at the Borough Commander's Awards. During his 283 hours of service as a special since he joined in October 2013, he has also supported the Edmonton Neighbourhood Patrol. The 39-year-old, who started work with the police in 2012, said, I became a special because I wanted to see if it was suitable for me to do. I've passed my exams and I can't wait to start work. An MP has called for a change in the law which would see anybody with a criminal conviction within the past five years banned from elected positions in local government. David Burrows, the Conservative MP for Enfield Southgate, has tabled an amendment to the government's devolution bill which would result in automatic disqualification. Currently, the law states that someone has to have been sentenced to three months in prison before they are banned from local councils. Mr Burrows has said that he specifically wants this amendment as an Enfield councillor who received a suspended sentence for a fraud offence in 2014 is still allowed to represent his ward. A police newsletter circulated in 2014 revealed that Nazimi Erbil, one of the councillors for Lower Edmonton, had been sentenced to four weeks' imprisonment, suspended for 12 months, fined £580 and given eight penalty points at Southwark Crown Court on September 26, 2014, for fraudulently displaying all London taxi badges in his black cab when he was only licensed to drive passengers in the boroughs of Enfield, Haringey, Waltham Forest and Hackney. Mr Erbil was suspended from the Labour Party in January, pending an investigation. He now sits on the council benches as an independent. Mr Burrows referred specifically to his case when calling on the government to toughen up rules around letting people with convictions stand for election to local government bodies. This amendment to the Act would ensure that any councillor convicted of an offence warranting a custodial sentence, whatever its length, was disqualified, said the MP. I am not sure why the original Act specified a three-month limit, but I think that we can do a lot better in 2015. Allowing people like Mr Erbil to continue in their posts after being convicted of fraud and sentenced to imprisonment will not instill public confidence. Mr Burrows admitted he had been prompted by the Leader of the Opposition on Enfield Council, Terry Neville, to look again at the national rules around elected representatives. Mr Neville said, We need to prove the standing of local government in the public view. This is essential 
if local government is to successfully take on the new powers in the government's local devolution bill. Council leader Doug Taylor confirmed that Mr Erbel was still suspended by Labour as the investigation into his behaviour continued. Mr Neville put a question about this issue to me at the last council meeting and I said to him, how can you implement tough rules for councillors when there are members of the House of Lords who have spent extensive time in prison? Students of a college course for budding florists demonstrated their blossoming talents by scooping a prize in, the prestigious, in, a, prestigious, excuse me, in a prestigious competition. Everything came up roses for the students of Capel Manor Horticultural College in Bulls Cross, Enfield, after competing in the New Covent Garden Flower Market College Day. More than 400 students from the college across the country took part in the event, which introduces the next generations of florists to the workings of the biggest wholesale flower market in the UK and the art of purchasing. Students with a budget of just £30 were given the task of sourcing, designing and creating Christmas door wreaths in two and a half hours. The UK Floristry Judges Guild provided expert assessments of the designs and the Covent Garden Market Authority judged the purchasing. Capel Manor's Level 3 students were far from shrinking violets and gained an impressive second place for their efforts. Natalie Revitt, the college's head of floristry, said... The opportunities like the new Covent Garden Market College Day help to prepare students for the industry and their future careers. It encourages them to work as a team and allows them to demonstrate their floristry knowledge and engage with the atmosphere and experience and it's what the mar flower market is all about. The college's School of Floristry offers courses at the flower market as its on-site educational provider. We are looking forward to the exciting transformations when the market undergoes a major redevelopment and landmark renovation next year to provide cutting-edge facilities for the florist of the future, added Mrs Revett. Thank you, Roz. I hope they don't have any stalkers. <laughs> Cock Fosters was made to pay for not taking advantage of their first half dominance as they suffered a 2-1 defeat at home to Hadley in the Spartan Premier League. The hosts were much the better side in the opening 45 minutes, but were unable to turn this into goals as they failed to convert any of the chances that they had created. Hadley were greatly improved in the second half and took the lead through Nathan Mumro before Tom Massey struck to get Cock Fosters back on level terms. However, the visitors were not to be denied and Mumro scored again to give them a win which resulted in them climbing above Cockfosters in the table. I think that frustrating would be the best word to describe my feelings about the game, manager Dean Barker said. We controlled the game in the first half and should have been four or five up, but we didn't take our chances. Hadley were the better team in the second period, but the game should have been over by half-time. I don't want to make any excuses, but we were missing a lot of players, and any side struggles if they are missing some of their better players. I was pleased for Tom that he scored. He's been with me for the last few seasons and is very loyal. His commitment levels are superb. I gave him the captaincy on Saturday, and he never lets us down. Meanwhile, Enfield, 1893, uh, came from behind to claim a 3-2 win at home to the same opposition in the Essex Senior League. Michael Batoni, Alex Salmon and Lewis Francis scored the goals as the E's claimed just their second league win of the season. A businessman has been fined thousands of pounds for flogging toxic skin lightening creams. Kabamba Tabukanga admitted selling the creams, containing a toxic mix of chemicals, when he pleaded guilty to 14 counts of not complying with the Cosmetic Products Safety Regulations Act 2008 at Tottenham Magistrates Court on November the 6th. The 53-year-old of Ho Lane, Enfield, 
was ordered to pay £4,620 in fines, £2,554 in costs and a £120 victim surcharge. His company, Gramadi Place Limited, was fined £6,160 and has been ordered to pay costs of £2,554. A routine ins inspection carried out by Enfield Council's Trading Standards Department led to the seizure of a raft of cosmetics containing the dangerous mix of mercury and hydroquinone. It is a chemical that can disfigure the skin by changes in pigmentation, as well as trigger itching, swelling and flaking. Use of the chemical above a certain concentration is banned in the EU and in the US. Mercury in skin lightening soaps and creams can lead to damage to kidneys as well as to the central nervous system. The toxin can also cause discoloration of the skin and long-term scarring. Some of the products were also found to be labelled with misleading information about the concentration of chemicals contained in them. The Council's Cabinet Chief in charge of Environment, Daniel Anderson, said, We will not tolerate businesses that put profits before the safety of our residents and will take quick and effective action against anyone who endangers the public by selling what are frankly dangerous products. This sentence sends out a very strong message and I sincerely hope it deters others from selling this kind of unsafe merchandise. A woman has described the experience travelling to Ethiopia to meet the child she sponsors. Shadi Olotobe, who lives in Southgate, donates £25 per month to help little Ms Ghana, who is living in poverty, have a better life. The 48-year-old began sponsoring Ms Ghana 6 through Charity Compassion over three years ago and has never looked back. She said, I was apprehensive at first because she's young and has never seen me, but when I saw her, I knew there was nothing to be afraid of because she's just a lovely little girl. She gave me a hug and I picked her up and hugged her back. It was a lovely meeting. Her mum came to and told me I had done everything they had asked without knowing what they needed. I was so humbled that somehow I was an answer to their prayers. Ms Garner lives with her mother, a trader, her father, a labourer, and her 12-year-old sister, but the family can struggle to find work and live in poverty. The £25 a month allows Ms Garner to be part of her local compassion project, where she receives healthy meals, emotional support, medical attention and the chance to go to school. Human Resources Manager, Ms Olotobe, became involved in compassion when a representative visited her church, Jesus House, in Brent Cross. During her trip, she visited projects around Addis Ababa and saw firsthand how various projects were changing the lives of children, their families and the communities. We've reached the end of our programme for this week. Thanks for listening. So from our team, it's... Goodbye. Please remember to turn over the address label in your postal packet, put the cassette into the packet and return it to us as soon as possible in readiness for the next edition. Don't forget, you can call Diane de Jersey regarding the boom boxes, our digital launch and any help you may need in connection with the Enfield Talking Newspaper. And the Enfield Talking newspaper will be with you again in one week's time.